I'm playing against Ludwig Carlsson, a young guy from Sweden, talented. Uh, he had a nice rise recently. He was over 2400, already international master, being about 20 years old. Very funny player. So I'm thinking what to play against him. And this is a Sunday game. The game starts at 10 a.m. So I'm going to take it slow. Out of three. Why not? Let's just play positional chess. He plays d5, he plays g6, and I vaguely remembered some of his games in a pre-game preparation that he plays this so-called Grunfeld setup. Okay, fine. Bishop g2, bishop g7, since black is threatening to play e5, I guess. I have to respond with d4, stopping this. And now we just transpose to some symmetrical Grunfeld. And this is where he made the very first surprise, which... Probably is not really a surprise, but still, I did not expect he's going to make a short castle because he already had played two games with c6. And the idea is if white commits to c4, black can take it. But I have a very nice memory from the French team chess championship two years ago when I played a very nice game against D. Nicol Antonio. I think he was an Italian player and I improvised a very nice game I played something like a5 c3 etc and ultimately scored a very impressive victory in something like 25 moves really nice I'm not sure maybe I even streamed the thing not sure I have to check so beautiful game so I have pleasant memories against this early c6 so he played show castle and you know what and I'm thinking okay c4 he can take on c4 and c6. And I'm thinking, so what did he play previously? And I start to try to remember what were, what were his games in the database. And I remember he was playing against Nikita Meshkov, my teammate. I mean, my teammate in the national team. And also we came together to Sweden. We left together uh, home from Sweden. And I'm thinking, wait a second. Nikita maybe already played this line because I really wanted to test this tricky move continuation a4 because he said to me this is a very tricky line but I could not remember did he play this line against Carlson himself you know and that's why I was slightly kicking myself I was kicking myself why did I not check this game more thoroughly in the morning because he had like two three games all it would take me is something like a couple of minutes. And I was sitting there, I was trying to remember, should I, sh was he playing this or was he not playing this against Carlsen? Okay, but I decided to play a4. The point is, knight a3, he has no access for b5. And bishop e6 runs into knight g5. So I'm killing the bishop, I'm taking the pawn on c4 with the great game. So of course, as Delp says, Black probably has to respond with a5. Now I take on d5. I mean, probably black has to take with a pawn to keep the center intact. Knight e5 is a different game. Yes, it's also possible, but I get the center. And now the key move, queen b3. Now you might be thinking, what is this? Right? Because black plays very quickly knight c6. I play knight c3. And... The more you're looking at this position, the more difficult it starts to become for black to find a move. Unless, of course, you're really well, well prepared. So it seems that knight b4 is a great move. But what about knight b5? I'm hitting the knight with bishop d2. And this extra tempo actually becomes quite important. For example, here, here. I mean, what do you do? Knight c2, rook c1, nothing. So it's not really so obvious for black. And here my opponent really surprised me. He played knight e4. And I was like, well, this makes no sense. Because I know that knight e4, of course, is a typical idea in the Grunfeld, but I don't quite understand 
why would you play knight e4 here? Because knight c3 b takes on c3 is not really a threat. So let me just make some random move. Rook d1, knight c3 b takes on c3. This is not a threat because a4, a5 cabin included, um, black has created himself multiple weaknesses on the queen side. So I'm going to play moves like bishop a3, e3, c4, and these pawns are the queens that are really weak, right? So, okay, so really surprised me. By the way, queen d5 is a trap, very basic trap. I mean, knight c3, queen d8, knight e2, of course, I cannot miss this. And uh, of course, I cannot take on d5. Yeah, there's bishop e6. But again, it's very basic, yeah? So um, I'm not really sure what's the actual idea of knight e4. And after the game, he said to me, he mixed up. He mixed up something. And he only knew the move knight a3, which I don't really understand why do you need this move. I guess to meet better knight b4 with bishop d2, and the knight is going to b5. And now here he said there's a move knight e4. Hitting the pawn on d4. So he mixed up something. All right. And uh, I'm looking at this position, I'm thinking, wait a second, but is the pawn on d4 even under attack? The same story as in one of the previous games, game number one I was showing to you. I mean, is the pawn on d4 even an under attack? So do I need to defend it? And the answer is no. I mean, I don't need to defend it, so I play bishop f4. So where's the problem? And I'm thinking about some rook d1, rook c1 ideas, and I ask him a very big question. How exactly do you plan to finish your development? What are you going to do with this pawn on b7? Thank you, Drama Queen, for the raid. Hope you had a good stream. I'm Latvian Grams, the Rattle Nations. Welcome, Raiders. I'm right now doing a coverage of my played games in the Swedish League. Last weekend, a Latvian Grandmaster. Average. <laughs> so, welcome, Raiders. This is the final game of three. Um, showing some of the interesting concepts. Hope you like it. So, welcome. All right, so after bishop f4, now the question is what should black do? And it, it's becoming increasingly difficult to find a move. Because let's say you play something like bishop f5, I can just take the pawn on b7. There's no rook b8, right? Uh, do you play b6? You need to calculate queen d5, queen c6. Do you play, what do you play? I mean, do you play rook a7? Do you play knight b4? Uh, there's knight e5, there's knight b5, the problem on c7. And the more Black was looking at this position, the more he realized that knight e4 was actually a mistake. I mean, knight e4 is just a bad move. And you know what, dear viewers? In chess, there's a very famous saying. Mistakes come in pairs. So if you make the first mistake, there's a very good likelihood, very good chance the next mistake is coming immediately. Why is this? Because you're already quite unhappy with your position. You realize something was missed. You don't like your choices. And at this moment, you are quite vulnerable. And uh, you're prone to make even a greater mistake. So if you find yourself in such a situation, when you just made a mistake, you're feeling quite unhappy, let me tell you, be on your alert. There's a very good chance you're going to commit the big mistake next move or the very next move after that, which he did. So he spent here like, I don't know, three minutes. He took on d4 with a lot of confidence. I'm like, what? Wait, I don't get it. What is knight e4? Meaning I'm better developed and you're opening the center. So, okay, knight e4, bishop d4. And the only thing I was... Sus having suspicions of maybe I have walked into a prep, you know, maybe because of the order of the move. Somehow I have landed in a position where my opponent knows everything. I mean, okay, fine, it could be. So I'm trying to understand what I'm missing here. So the first move I'm looking at is knight e4, d takes, and bishop e4. Does this look like a miss to you? No. I mean, I have the better pieces. By the way, I have also access to rook d1, pinning the bishop. The pawn on e4 is under attack. 
So I'm thinking, wait a second, what's the what's the issue here? What I'm missing? So I start to spend more time, more time, and even more time. And I just realize, wait a second. There's 95, right? <laughs> His position is about to collapse because those pieces, they're really bad. And, and that's it. So I'm about to hit everything. There's rook d1, there's knight c7, and that's it. So I'm thinking, what am I missing here? I'm missing nothing. And then, of course, I had a glimpse at the body language of my opponent. Yeah, I, I knew it. I knew that he blundered. He mixed up something, it's, which was really strange because he's a very good player. Very good player. And uh, some brain lag or something. I don't know what happened. So it happens. Uh, one thing he started to do right now. My opponents will start to play really fast because he suspected that he is losing and that's why he tried to apply as much pressure as he could against me. He played knight f6. And yeah, I spent some time here choosing which rook goes to b1 because something like knight c7 and then follow up with rook d1, I was not really sure because he might just sacrifice the exchange. But I'm looking for the kill. The, now the difference is which rook goes to d1. Why not bishop e6? Because there's bishop e4 and the knight on b5 is protected. He's just down a piece. That's why. Maybe this is what he missed from afar. I don't really know. So, yeah, he played knight f6. And I initially wanted to play rook d1. To, you know, to make sure there's no threats on f2. But I saw he might sacrifice a queen. Which probably is very close to winning. But again, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I mean, okay, I'm going to take the pawn on b7. He has the knight and the rook for the queen and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so it's going to be a long fight. But of course, I'm looking for the cleanest continuation. And that's why I play rook fd1. Because he can't sacrifice the queen no more. I have king of one. Yeah, so it's a small nuance to make sure this is not happening. So I take with the rook on d4. There's no queen b6. I take on d5. Everything is protected. I mean, bishop e6, queen e5. I'm just up a piece. So he has to go here. And I'm thinking, what's the cleanest way to win? So of course, bishop h6. I need to attack the rook. Rook e8. And now, yeah, now of course I'm looking for the... I'm looking for the big move. Now, where is it? E4. Very tempting. E4, he will play queen b6. I can't take on d5. The bishop... Yeah, I can't take this knight. I guess I take it. And he wants to play e5, bishop e6. So, this position is, you know, not as winning as I thought it is. And I trade the queens. I don't have the kings that attack. So, big no-no to me. Then I'm thinking, okay, rook d1 is an easy move. Because, again, queen b6. Now I take on d5. So, queen b3, bishop b3, I'm up a piece. He can't play queen b6. And if he plays queen f6 to try to guard those weaknesses, I was thinking e4 and e5. Meaning... Rook d8, goodbye. Yeah, so he can't defend the rook. There's no bishop d7. I take the bishop. Uh, yeah, so because of the back rank, he's simply losing. And he plays something like queen e7, h4, bishop g5, bishop f6, queen e3, queen h6. He's done. There's definitely a mate. So that's why he played queen e7. And this is where I saw some very funny lines. Because I want to finish this game immediately. So I'm looking at bishop d5 and queen c3. How do you defend from the mate? So I'm finding some very nice ideas. For example, he goes, take it. Idea number one. Queen e2 is a mate. Queen c3 is a mate. He can't do it. Idea number two, he plays queen f6. 
Again, pretty cute. Queen takes c3, rook e8, d takes on e4, queen takes on f6. Uh, probably the cutest idea of them all, queen e5. <coughs> anyway, rook e4. And uh, now the point is, he can't take on e5, there's rook d8 and checkmate on the board. So when I saw this, I really, really wanted to go here. Really. Because it's sort of like it's a confirmation that this is the right choice. But of course, I'm smarter than that, and I know that my opponent is also not bored yesterday, and he sees all of this, so he probably is going to play f6. I'm thinking, if I take on d5, bishop e6, probably it's winning, but it's a longer game. How about I force him to play f5? Because then I could just collect the pawn, and there's always the mate threats on g7, etc. But I see there's queen e2. I want to take on f6, trading with mate ideas, and I'm thinking it's winning. <laughs> this would have made a very nice chess comp puzzle. So, yeah, I saw this. I saw this in the calculation, and I thought, wow, this would have been a really nice way to throw a winning game, right? Very, very nice. <laughs> and king of, uh, king of three is queen h1 mate on the board. So I saw all of these ideas and uh, yeah, this queen sacrifice also. And my opponent also confirmed after the game he saw it as well. So he also knew that I'm very tempted to play queen c3. That's why I burned here quite a lot of time. Because again, the game feels like there's a kill. There should be a kill, right? So that's why here I decided, okay, listen. I'm just going to play with a hand. I'm just simply going to go for the king set attack, which I trust should be winning. So I play e4 and e5. That's it. So my idea is really simple. h4, put the bishop in f6, queen e3, queen h6, h5. Just checkmate, you know. Don't go for extra pawns. I don't need that. And if you play something like knight e5, just play h4. h4, bishop g5. For example, let's say he goes here, here, here. Yeah, maybe. I'm not really sure if this is necessary. Here, here, here. It's a win. I mean, obstacle bishops, they're known as extra pieces in attack. And this bishop on f6 is a monster. But my opponent here collapsed very quickly. He played knight c6, which technically is a mistake. But again, it doesn't really matter. Queen e3, and I'm about to checkmate. He played here, he played bishop b7, and now very nice order the moves. By the way, rook d7 would be a mistake. I can't do this. So I need to be tactically careful, not to miss any ideas. Otherwise, it seems like I'm winning a piece, right? But I first play bishop g5, hit a queen. He can't go here. That's a mate. There's no queen c6. The rook on d6 protects the c6 square. And now I play rook d7, and that's it. Now bishop h6 is a big threat to trap the queen. And that's it. So bishop c6 or bishop d5, I just play bishop h6, I collect the queen. So he had to go here, I play here. And yeah, queen c8 or queen e8 doesn't matter, either queen g5 or queen f4. He is not even in time to play queen c6. Because here, I just hit the pawn immediately. Or if I want, I can play queen g5, queen c6, and rook d8. It's a mate. So the final move in the game was queen e8, queen g5. That's a mate on the board, and he resigned. So I, I don't really... I think this was the easiest game I had historically in the Swedish league by crushing a very good opponent in 26 moves. But then again, my opponent made some weird choices, right? I mean, this knight e4, this knight d4, again, let's go back here. It just, I was so surprised, right? I mean, one mistake, second mistake. And that's it. I mean, after this, there's there's nothing, there's nothing he can do. Absolutely nothing. No chance for him to show what he's capable of. So, but okay, I mean, I'll take it, right? Oh, by the way, there was one more trick I missed. There was one more trick. Um, he could have played e5, which I was expecting he's going to play. 
The point is, bishop g5 seems like it's winning, but it's not. My queen on b3 is under attack. Look at this. Bishop f6, bishop d5. But uh, there was a very cute refutation. I play rook d4. And not bishop g5 because of bishop e6, but bishop c7. <laughs> and uh, he's getting a fork and losing the queen. So this was really nice. So after rook d4, e takes an f4, yeah, and he's just suffering. Yeah, down a pawn, big attack. So this is something I didn't include. So I finished the uh, league weekend with three wins in a row, and we cemented ourselves a lead in the overall rankings.